Yeah, there's a lot of people probably trolling podcasts to figure <laughs> out the vulnerabilities uh, in in people's home security. Yeah. Like, oh well, mine is it. very robust. I will tell you. Bring yeah, it. Like booby traps and yeah. trap doors and the floor and stuff. Indiana Jones. You. Yeah. Yeah. So, I have what I think is the world's greatest analogy that I just came up with. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for joining me, man. Um, yeah, we had we we had a lot of fun the first episode um, talking about setting up a forty-five minute impossible session, which the, you know, to full transparency, we didn't end up following through on. But I I appreciated the thought experiment. Um, yep. And uh, and it kind of it followed along with a lot of my experiences with with facilitation where I can only, I can only tell you what I think is possible and it's kind of up to them. It, you know, it reminds me of this. Have you read finite and infinite games? The book? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, James Cars. Um, well, he said like yeah. one of the, yeah. So, uh, you haven't seen the movie yet. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's not as good. Uh, I'm just now imagining what the movie would be like. It's yeah. In Lego form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, he says this thing and, you know, pretty early on, which is um, you can't, if you, if you're forced to play, the, it, you can't play like in order to actually play, you have to accept the invitation and willingly participate. And anytime you're actually being forced. And, and that reminds me a lot of the, uh, of the facilitation space it's it is a it's it you you're inviting people into an infinite space where you know you're you're kind of allowing what is possible to kind of reveal itself which yep. is very much you know it's not like set rules and there are rules for what constitutes winning at the end which you know you do want to have set objectives but you kind of have to allow what what happens to reveal itself um, it's the same which reason is why, why uh, I never liked cleaning up the house and was never good at it because I was forced. Because you were forced. Know. Yeah. Yeah. That no, that I think that does uh <laughs> I think I think that does count definitely in some way or another. One thing I've been thinking about a lot is the the concept of the invitation, right? It's like you have to you have to present it in a way where they willingly step into the space with you because if you I mean yes. you've you get people into a, a facilitated workshop or something and they're they're against their will. I actually heard that we might be that that this might be a problem with a with a training program that you and I are going through together that some people have been voluntold to participate. No doubt. And that has messed up a lot of the dynamic of the design thinking program uh, for those individuals. And and it has this effect on the people around them. Yeah. You know, so I don't know if you want to go down this or not, but I'll, I'll just briefly say it. Um, and I feel like I'm in the matrix somewhere. Um, I'm Neo, by the way, um, okay. in my own mind. <laughs> or, I'm also Neo. <laughs> okay, good. Um, all, yeah, everybody's Neo in their own head. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the cat is going by or something twice, but uh, essentially, and if you haven't seen that, like, just stop watching this and go watch at least the first one. <laughs> Don't watch the rest of them. I've seen the um, first one. I have not. I don't. I think I just walked out in the middle of the second one or something. Yeah. I, just watch John Wick uh, instead. Yeah. <laughs> John Wick is and, the major anyway, character. So uh, did I speak with you about invitations or was that someone else? I, I, I sent you a text message about invitations about as something that I that I was considering. As, OK, as a concept. so. So the way that you invite, not only like the means, like the email or the text message or the phone call or whatever it is, not not just that, but like the the deeper, you know, energy and feel behind it carries 100% of the way through. I mean, I could talk about that mm. forever. It's essentially like, it's what you just said. It's getting people to actually buy in and not sending them like a three page thing where they don't read any words. 
which happens <laughs> to mm -hmm. me. Like I read fast. Yeah. Um, send me like a three sentence thing. I'll read every single word. I'll probably have it memorized and I'm ready to rock. Um, it's the same way for invitations. Like how can you do a very small thing to get people on board for like a 15 minute joint call so that now you know who's interested to kind of move forward from there. That has been very beneficial for me anyways, in getting people actually on board. So it's not a voluntold, voluntel thing, whatever. Um, and I think I told you this before, but I've run numerous experiments on <laughs> asking for the naysayers of a group and volunteering them as a company to attend. Like send me your worst, <laughs> you know, yeah. and see what happens. And um, I have found some pretty interesting things of the people that volunteer versus the ones that are voluntold to go. And I think my biggest takeaway from it is the impact of an organization. And I think I've told you this before. This is where the matrix comes in. Um, the impact of having one individual who's already excitable, who's already the person that tells everyone else, hey, I found this new great book. I saw this new great movie. Uh, you guys should see this new tool. That person doesn't have as big of an impact on an organization telling another positive thing as somebody that's negative telling yeah. a positive thing because you're doing a couple things. One, you're stopping them from saying something negative, yeah. which everybody already hears. Two, everyone's ears perk up when they're actually excited about something. And so it's like, you know, it's like you're a family member who never gets excited about something and then for once is like really genuinely interested in something. And you just want to know everything there is to know about it. You're like, tell me more about yeah. it. I, you know, if you're excited about this, I'm going to stop everything I'm doing right now and, and go read it or watch it or, or see, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So this is related to something like I ended up having another conversation yesterday about uh, about Karen Hold's paper uh, and Jean Lidka and their paper, The Innovator's Journey. Um, the this concept of the transformation over the course of the process of design thinking, right? I've found to be a particularly powerful concept. Um, and we talked about uh, I talked about it on the last episode of this podcast with Karen Hold. Um, this idea that you're not just Going you have to say her uh, her middle name. I don't. She she comes with Karen all. Karen Pettyhold. Yeah. Pettyhold. Yeah, yeah. I don't know Karen why. Just how I think yeah. about it. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this idea that it's not just a set of practices. It's also like these. There are the experiences, the experiencing element. That, that that's a layer of what you, it needs to be a part of it. Um, so as a facilitator, you're monitoring each of the steps to make sure people are having the experience they need. And then there's this other layer, which is the becoming layer, which is the transformation that happens as a result of having those experiences. And what you just said kind of reminds me of this question that I've had, um, which I just had another conversation about yesterday, um, about the way that we invite people, you know, um, because we have these different sort of cognitive types, um, there are a certain type who are going to be attracted to the invitation, to the way that we invite people. It's going to be weirdos like you and me. It's going to be people who are like, hell yeah, something different. So like, this is going to be weird and uncomfortable and strange, and we don't know what's going to happen. I want, I want to be there to see what happens. Right. That's, <laughs> that's the type of person that I am. There's another type of person who is also important uh, to, you know, in the way that you just said, um, because of who they are in an organization, for example, like what type of influence they have on the organization. I'm also hearing that I think that they are like, you know, if if you were thinking like theory of constraints, they are the constraint within an organization on cultural shift. Like there are individuals who can like, if they can just block culture change by their attitude, by their response. Um, and it's, probably more important that they have the experience of becoming through whatever, you know, whatever you facilitate, then even that you produce something specific at the outcome, right? Yeah. So you know, that's it's, kind of a, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, my, my uh, parallel to that for anybody that's in the military and you, you know, this is, this is in corporate as well, but we call it voluntary fun, you know, where you have an, an event where you're either, uh, giving an award for somebody or saying like hail and farewell to uh, somebody in your organization in the military. 
And everyone's like, oh, I can't believe we're doing this on a Saturday. Like, I wanted to spend time with my family. I, you know, yeah. what the heck? This is going to be a waste of time. And then you get there and it's actually fun. I mean, if you organize it right and, you know, have have the appropriate uh, energy there and, and whatnot. And it's actually fun. So it's like, okay, well, how can you get people that don't respond well to the invitation, don't want to be there, and maybe they're only there because they were either voluntold or they have uh, FOMO? And yeah. actually get them to latch in. Um, and to me, that's doing something that is incredibly impactful in a very, very short amount of time. And I've seen this in almost every course that I've ever truly latched on for myself is they've proven the concept immediately. Prove it to me in a very small way, very quickly. It's not like this game changer of a thing, but it's like, wow, I can't believe what I just saw in, in only five minutes. Well, now imagine what would happen if you gave me 50 and I actually show you the experience and you get to feel it and, you know, all that stuff. So, yeah. So what are your, do you have like a specific move for you that you, uh, yeah. Get people to have that experience initially to, to, to like buy in what, what's, what's your secret sauce there? So, so there's a couple, I mean, you have to take into account, it depends on who's there and you know, yeah. how, how in depth you can go with a group of people that you've never met before, or do they know you, et cetera. My go-to for people that either know me or, you know, at least think that I'm decent prior to meeting me <laughs> in some <laughs> way through uh, reputation uh, I'll do a personal one. I will ask them to fix something in their own life. They don't have to share it with anybody. I give them almost no time. I force them to, you know, forcing function of time to say, hey, you only have three minutes to to do X. So divergent thinking. Mm -hmm. You have a certain amount of time to break it down into categories, convergent thinking. You have X amount of time to rack and stack these on what's imp impactful or important to your family or yourself or your spouse or whatever, or, yeah. or give them some kind of um, weighted value of categories. And then, and then say, Hey, what, what are you going to do tomorrow? What could you do tomorrow or later today that could potentially be the, the start of a new, um, a new ism, something that you're now doing a new habit. Yeah whatever right yeah and, and usually that that's at least something that they can follow along with it doesn't take very long five minutes six minutes super quick um another one could be something like uh you've i don't know if you've seen this before it's in lego uh and a, and a couple other ones which is you have to turn over your job to the next person how are you going to do this so that they succeed or so that you know, you, your turnover is non-existent after this one minute with them. What are you going to say? What are you going to do? And you relate that to a specific obstacle. And then you have them focus on it and go, wow, like I just had a discussion with somebody in two or three minutes and really understood the scope of, of where they're at, where they're going and, you know, how they want to get there. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I, um, that reminds me a lot of this this version of the minimum effective dose of, of uh, like design thinking or human centered design called the innovators compass. This, I, I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's, it's just innovators compass.org. And the, the, you know, the, the basic idea was to make the, that facilitated journey, that very small loop just as accessible as possible. So they put it on a single canvas and they were like, you know, it, it includes all their desired elements. It's, uh, it's who's involved, you know, uh, what are some experiments we could try? Um, what are some observations, just make observations about the, um, about the experience. Um, oh, what are the other ones? There's like, Oh, I'm going to look it up. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking, I'm trying to look at it right now. It's, um, you know that brings us what are oh what are the things that matter most that's like a that's one of the quadrants so it's, it's idea so you start with who's involved right you start with who are the people who are we even talking about because you can't you can't and you can do it in order or not it's kind of just a frame it's a framework right so do what works for you 
who's involved, what's happening, like what are what are the what are the experiences that people are happening having, and then the third quadrant is what are the principles, what are the things that matter most. So now we're digging into the values, like what's the value we're trying to create, and then you talk about ideas. What is that, what are some think like what are some things we could try, and then the fourth quadrant is experiments. So it's just this rapid movement from who's involved what's happening, like what matters, what let's have some ideas. Now let's talk about specific experiments. And that's kind of like, that's design thinking humans that are designed in its like simplest form. And one of the cool things about it is you, if you're not, a, if you get to the experiment step and you're like, oh, I can't think of anything specific. Well, let's go back to people. Do we need to involve somebody new? Like, let's just add a person there and see if that changes how we observe the situation, how, you know, what matters most. Did we fill out what matters most enough? And then maybe that informs what our ideas are. So it's like, it's just this sandbox, right? It, with these very, very simple constraints. Um, and that reminds me a little bit of your, I mean, the fact that that can be a powerful experience, I think speaks to the, um, like the it's the heart of the you know the facilitated discovery experience to me because it's it's this very simple thing that so many people have trouble with just because we don't think in these terms right we don't yep. we don't constrain ourselves naturally uh in the right ways so along along those lines you said do what works for you and my the thing that i try to convey that i think is super important that is sometimes missed is you don't have to pick up the whole process. You don't even have yeah. to pick up half the process. Like you could pick up one inkling, one small fraction of what, what took place. And if that makes your life easier, faster, safer, cheaper, uh, you know, whatever, use that piece. You know, like you don't need to have people hanging on the end of every word that you say to, to get the entire process down. They don't have to memorize it perfectly. And it can be this approach where they learn that they use it now they they want to know what's next and, yeah. and what's next and then what's next i mean i think everything is like a spectrum no matter what uh well most people most things um this is the beginning part of a bell curve and the let's take a year-long course on on it is the right hand side of the bell curve right yeah i i'm somewhere in the middle like sometimes yeah. I want to do something that's short, sweet, quick. Sometimes I want to do stuff that's longer in the weeds. And it really depends on what you're going for. Like, are you going to teach people or are you going to actually solve something? Um, and managing the expectations of what they want is goes back to what you said in the beginning, which is the invite. Like, what are they going to get from this? Are they going to learn something? Or are they going to yeah. do something? Is it both? Yeah. Yeah, there's this there's this aspect that I've wondered about a few times of the getting people to go through the process in a way that is kind of involved enough to get them to have the experiences and achieve the insights that they do. One really common tactic I've seen is the is actually really similar to the summer of design model or the hacking for defense model. It is you're actually solving problems under the you know, you're you're I mean, you could look at it two ways. You're solving problems under the guise of teaching people or you're teaching people under the guise of solving problems. Yeah. And I think there's a I think there's a reason for that. And it might be maybe like maybe it's because the invitation it, it has to uh, it, it draws people in in a different kind of way when you tell them that they're gaining something from this experience. Yeah. And, and along the lines of that entire thing, I think the most important piece of all of that is the right amount of transparency. So like, yeah, you want to be transparency almost to a fault at certain things. And, and for me, it works. It works for my personality. It doesn't work for everybody. You might lose people if you tell them out of the gate, like, we're only doing this so that I get the two or three people who can take my position at the, at the end of this. Yeah. Like, That's not yeah. going to work so well. Um, but uh, if you actually say, hey, look, um, we're, we're doing this. It's going to take this much time. And this is what you're going to get from it. And it's the first phase. You don't have to go to the whole thing. But here's, here's a piece of it. And I'm so confident in it. 
that I think that you're going to join us uh, for follow on sessions like that yeah. usually works. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of speaks to kind of the, the importance of, uh, I mean, it sounds like you're uh, a lot of times you're playing a long game there. Um, uh, I, oh, I yeah. think a lot of times people are thinking in terms of when, you know, they want to facilitate something, they want to give people the, you know, give people this explosive experience of, of producing like a massive innovation or something. They're like, we gotta, we gotta really deliver on our first workshop. Right. But it sounds like for you, sometimes the strategy is first, the, the first experience is more about getting them on board for the follow on experiences. Oh yeah. Well, so yes, yes and no. And I feel like you did this on purpose because this is exactly what I did with, you asked me to draw a picture. I don't know if you want to insert yeah. this or not, but it like I, ties in I really well, with it, I think. It's like, we, yeah, let's do it. I, just, <laughs> I, know. I don't do anything on purpose, just oh, for yeah. the record. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I, so I asked you to do a similar kind of, you know, self, uh, self analysis or self visualization exercise where you, draw a picture or do some kind of visual representation of your uh, your relationship with the field of design and discovery or facilitation. So yeah, let's have at it. This is uh, it's like you. It's like it's like you saw what I was doing. This is kind of creepy. <laughs> um, all right. So you asked me to draw a picture. And so yeah. I made um, I made a Lego um, model of of what I want to share with you. And I'll be like super quick, but we could like go into it later if you want. So the idea here is this is uh, this is me over here. And yeah. I'm standing on top of green. These colors actually mean something. So yeah. I think in a, oh shoot. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Was that part of the visualization? <laughs> it's all part of it. Everything's done yeah. perfect over here. So <laughs> I will, I'll explain this portion of the model for right now. Okay, yeah. So, so the colors, this is design thinking to me. This is human centered yeah. design. This is getting buy-in for almost anything. This is like the the bottom of the, the thing is is red. You can't yeah. do that. We you can't do that. We can't do that. It's never gonna happen. We don't have enough time. We already did this 10 years ago and it didn't work. Like yeah. definitely stop. Nothing there, right? And then there's this, yeah. you know, like phase into yellow, which is where you you prove them wrong with one small thing, like whether it's a small exercise or an offsite or a retreat, or like whatever the heck that is, right? And yeah. it's like, oh, uh, you can do this, but you can't do any of that stuff. Sure, you proved yeah. us wrong, and we'll use you for you know every time that we really want to dive into culture. But strategy, like leave that to us because we've we've been in the same silos for twenty eight years, and yeah. We, we're we're way worse at doing it than you. I mean, better, you know, like, yeah, right. And then it goes into green, which is like, hey, you can do this. Yeah. But nobody else like you're, you're the guy or gal that can do it. We don't trust anybody else. No way. Yeah. Right. And then goes into the next phase, which is like the wings here. And there's a bunch of eyes on it, which is like, we can now do this. Yeah. Okay. So now it's not just an individual. It's a we. And then the the hot pink at the top where uh, somebody else is also there, which is is more like, okay, not only can we do this, but we can do it well. And we have the buy-in and people are excited about it, et cetera. So if I showed the other, the other piece of the model, you know, like to me, a facilitator is not the one like over here. Yeah. A facilitator is looking at a bigger picture. It's kind of like the maestro is not doing anything. Yeah. They're they're the one shepherding or giving advice or mentorship or guidance, looking at the whole picture and going, hey, here's how I think you can get into this crack or here's how you can get a win here. Here's how you can go from yellow to uh, to green. Here's how we can go from green to whatever the heck that color is off white eggshell, whatever. I don't know what colors are. Um, and and you kind of take them along that that step. So by no means do I have any kind of musical talent whatsoever yeah um, but i decided to make myself a facilitator uh you know my yeah friend. like a conductor yeah i yeah. uh i love that um i i like the 
that you basically built like an innovation maturity model there um, or a matu- like a maturity framework where you start with just like we need systems in place because of all the constraints and, you know, like um, everybody kind of stay in your own lane because th- it, in order to solve these these difficult like, uh, you know, domain specific problems, we need domain specific experts. Yep. Um, which, you know, and the only way to, to like really solve our problems is to just dig in and go deeper into our own, you know, area of expertise. Um, and then that yellow, I, I, so I think there's something that Rita McGrath said in her latest book, Seeing Around Corners, uh, which really struck me, which is in her maturity model for innovation, she talks about how innovation theater is a legitimate stage of development for or you know an organization ultimately achieving what you what you showed as like the green and the, or the pink um which is you know it's it's like democratized and there's there's creative confidence kind of infused across the organization and it's you know there's an understanding of multi domain you know intersection where where you facilitate discovery con- continuously right um and that idea that innovation theater is not the enemy but rather just a it's it's kind of just this is where we're at like we just have to we have to we have to exist in this pocket and like you said it's it's it can be very domain specific with like all right i guess for culture stuff right which is you know I think because there is not a, there's not like a specific domain expert within our organizations that is currently working on the issue of culture, that it tends to, you know, fall to whoever the innovation field is. Also that, you know, culture is an important thing to tackle from the perspective of fostering innovation, right? Um, But, but yeah, no, I see a ton, like, I, I, I think that's a fantastic illustration of, um, of kind of the uh, the journey, although I I personally have never seen, except in those innovation, you know, those pockets, those like innovation cells, I've I still have yet to see an organization like a, a military organization achieve what I would consider the you know moving from the you know the red to the green or the pink. I I I'm still waiting. <laughs> so here, so I actually have I'm I'm glad you said that because. I sort of disagree. Um, well, I, I can't disagree with your own opinion, but I, I will say um, I think you're looking at it potentially in terms of a command yeah. that, ha- that has taken this in and done X, Y, or Z with it. Like yeah. that's what success looks like to most military. Like the admiral or the general has taken this on board and we now have a champion across the spectrum. But like mm-hmm. it's much smaller than that. It's mm-hmm. This division has now completely changed the way that they think, operate, communicate, collaborate, um, and get work done, right? Yeah. And then it's this department just happens to have the right uh, division officers and chiefs, uh, you know, together that are doing their thing a little bit differently, or the yeah. chiefs mess, or the officers mess, or you know, the first class petty officer association, like. The win is not, in my opinion, the massive structure. And the reason for that is the PRD or, you know, the the rotation of any person, and this is in corporate as well, is you're few and far between from either you leaving or the person who's to left or right of you leaving or getting another position where they're no longer in the cognizance of help anymore. Yeah. Like if you boil it down much smaller and create a culture within a culture, yeah. You can have that winning thing forever because now when somebody changes out, you have 10 people who are 100% bought in to this process. You're now the outsider coming in. So what are you going to do? You are going to take yeah. on the new culture as opposed yeah. to the other way around, which is this cog in the wheel is so big that if they don't buy off on it immediately, the, the house of cards crumbles and it no longer works. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I no, I I I definitely uh agree with that and I and I'm glad you said that that the the only way to maintain this 
especially in the face of what is, you know, what are some, you know, behemoth kind of cultural, you know, elements in across these large, you know, uh, hierarchical structures of the military, you know, within the bureaucracy, there are, there are just, there are fixtures, there are constraints in place, which prevent uh, the, the scaling of a lot of these, these things, which, uh, yeah, when, when I say that I haven't seen it like an innovation strategy that I, that I would say is, is, uh, is fully mature. Um, I'm, I'd say like at the group or the wing level with the air force, um, I have yet to see, um, an organization that isn't brand new, really kind of get it at scale in a way where you know, you could foster those little pockets in a number of places without yep. a, an individual driver being the one who did it. So, and, and that speaks to like, so I, I think that's because we've, we've, we face these massive constraints at the larger level. Um, but one of the things that we are able to do kind of right now is create those effects in small pockets, um, which is one of the things that like I'm trying to do with Agitari, right? It's to get facilitators to provide those experiences to kind of demonstrate the art of the possible and, and uh, you know, show people the value of this stuff and then show them how to start incorporating it, even in just very small ways, right? So like, an, an example of that would be, uh, I, I mean, kind of what the CAW is getting after, right? It's like the Centers for Adaptive Warfighting. They're like, here are some here are some things that you can facil facilitate in your own environment to demonstrate the, the alternate way. And then here are some things to kind of make that self-reflection sustainable, such, such as like incorporating principles like Scrum. Um, yeah. And... And that's something that I'm really interested in. And some of the projects that I want to get after with Agitari are what are some other things that we could do? Like, uh, for example, a re retrospectives, in my opinion, are one of the most powerful things that you can incorporate into an organization. And it is also one of the low, easiest, lowest threshold asks of an organization. Yep. Hey, just talk to each other <laughs> for 30 minutes a week, right? Just yep just take a look at yourself for a moment regularly and you will be kind of astounded at the, that the impacts that that can have. But let me tell you a, a funny story about when I tried to introduce retrospectives to an organization, I presented this idea. I was like, Hey, I think that there, I think we could use some self-reflection right in within this team. And um, I think it would have this profound impact. Like it would just create a little bit of transparency where I think there is none. I, it would create a bubble of psychological safety where I personally, and I can't say for sure, right? Uh, we don't. It's hard to say for sure whether there's low psychological safety here. Uh, he said winkingly, but the the psychological safety there, in my opinion, was atrocious. People just they they behaved in the ways you'd expect them to in a low psychological safety environment. They formed tiny cliques where they felt the safest and you didn't hear anything from within those clicks, right? Yep. At least at the leadership levels. And so I said, here's re retrospectives. It's a very simple facilitated experience. You just get, you kind of create the space and you use some constraints that kind of trick people into opening up, right? Use, use little pictures like the sailboat, right? What's, what's the anchor? What's holding us back? What are we trying to get to? What's, what is our sunshine? Right. And it, it, it works a lot of times to get people to just, they want to fill in the blanks or whatever. Um, and the response I got was that was fear about what would happen if people actually said things that were wrong. And this is coming from leadership in this organization. They were concerned about what might happen if something came up that, that they felt was too big to deal with. And I was like, you do understand like this is a perfect demonstration of what's wrong right now like yes. just the strangest you know we are in an irony circle right now yeah yeah amazing <laughs> so okay i wrote down a bunch of stuff i want to i want to backtrack a, a few things i'll start somewhere in in here yeah so 
along the lines of that, I, I would say, and that happens a lot actually, all over the spectrum, which is what happens if you actually ask for negative feedback? Yeah. Like you're asking for it and you're like, I don't want to hear that. This is going to, it's going to ruin our culture. And I'm like, do you understand that everyone's saying this to their family when they go home? Yeah. They're saying it to people <laughs> that aren't even in the organization, but they're not saying it to each other. Or if they are, it's just few and far between. Like, so the answer to your question is what happens when people actually acknowledge it? It's like, well, now you can move on. Now you can yeah. actually start, you know, yeah. like, you can't really start until we're in agreement that there's work. Yeah, to be this, done the sickness is there. You're yeah. just agreeing to look at whether there are symptoms. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. We're, we're not uh, we're not ostriches. Uh, well, we shouldn't be. <laughs> you know, like yeah. And I I would say the remedy there. And this is like a very big generalization. So like, don't come back to me if you're listening to this and say, John, this didn't work. But transparency, I think, is the remedy. When you yeah. go to everybody and you go, hey, some stuff's going to come out of this meeting. Uh, we're not going to call anybody names. We're not going to uh, make it unsafe for anybody else. We're just going to call it like it is and see what happens. And, and you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take it from here. Trust your leadership in, in that we actually care about you. We want to move the needle for you as an individual, for the group, et cetera, et cetera. So that's like one thing. Retrospectives, 100%. Totally agree big problem with retrospectives, uh, getting on board with them is people don't have a timer in their brain. So it's like yeah. you ask somebody to speak for 15 seconds and they speak for a minute and 50 seconds. Well, that's mm -hmm. like a big, big difference when you're talking about something that should be super, super quick. Yeah. And so something that works, I think really well with that is passive, uh, passive feedback, which is Nobody is allowed to tell you, the person talking, hey, we tried it, we did it, it didn't work, or we're working on it, or we thought about it, or yeah, you're just not part of this conversation. Because everybody always wants to rebuttal by saying that they are already working on it. You know what I mean? They yeah. always, everybody always wants to say in front of everybody, well, I've already been working on that for the last uh, year or two, and you don't know what I know. It's like, who cares? Yeah. If you if you just make it passive and everybody has a chance to just go this, this, that, you know, now you know what's out there. Yeah. And now you can actually pick and choose where you have your conversations. Okay. So that's one. I wrote down drops of water. So I think that, you know, and this ties in the Lego, my Lego thing and your long-term strategy uh, uh, epiphany of how I think, which is you're never going to turn everybody into the ocean of human centered design. It is not going to work. Yeah. It's just not. You just yeah. you need enough of the water droplets to create puddles to create I don't know the, you know, the progression of how to make an ocean out of a puddle, but it's, it's somewhere between water drops and an ocean and a bunch of yeah. puddle streams and no, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> I think something like that. Um and then the uh the other piece of that is the cool part is the people doing it now, and I'm not saying by any means um, this has nothing to do with age. This has more to do with where you were put into an experience, uh, you know, rise. So if you jump in at the beginning of an experience and say that experience is a 10 years at this job or two or five or whatever, like if you jump in somewhere in the beginning and you buy off on something and you are on that journey, somewhere along the line, you have either gotten a new position or you're in a, a higher level of responsibility or accountability or whatever it is. And eventually you become the person that says, Hey, this is okay. Let's, let's go to from green to this off white color to, you know, hot pink, yeah. and, you know, Lego analogy. It's like you eventually become the one that allows everybody to have a bigger voice. So it's like, it is a long-term play. You, you know, yeah. There's a there's a thing there that I've thought about a number of times, which is um, if something if so I have this problem with, for example, um, the the leadership pattern of thinking mental model that I've noticed tends to be 
I think that people who had an experience, you know, kind of coming up, for example, hazing, hazing is a perfect example of this. I, you know, like I, or people who were like beat by their parents, right. They say all the time, it was like, my dad hit me, right. Like, and, and that's why I am who I am today. There's a, there is a bias that we have, that we all have kind of instinctively, which yep. is what happened to me. It must've been okay because like, and it must've been like an important building block to who I am today. That's like a, that's an important narrative. I think for a lot of people to tell themselves as a, you know, as, as a survival mechanism, it, it, it makes sense as a survival mechanism, right? Like yeah. you experienced trauma as a child. Maybe you can convince yourself that it was supposed to have happened. Um, yep. and there's this thing that I've seen in the military, which is that these frustrated people, you know, they, they like, they hang in there, you know, maybe they were like really innovative or they didn't understand what was happening to them at a young age. I'm not saying that just, you know, everything that happens to you, it, you know, in the military, it, it doesn't make sense or like that, uh, you know there aren't bad, ex difficult experiences that are useful or important or, or can help you grow. But what I do have this fear about is that people who were not empowered as you know, junior enlisted or junior officers or whatever, they get into positions of leadership and they go, well, I, I earned my ability to now be empowered. And then they don't pass that along and they, they kind of, they maintain the system that brought them to where they are or that is now kind of giving them the ability to be the, the, the empowered innovators that they now are. And I, I also think that there's this transformation that can happen where I'm constantly afraid of losing empathy for my past self. Because I think that that's a tendency that we all have. You it's say that again. to to lose empathy for my past self. Got it. Okay. To look at somebody who's in the exact position that I was in, and to feel like somehow my new perspective is more valid than my perspective was at that time. It's a tendency to think that it's a bias to think that just because more time has passed, I'm now wiser. But I think that we neglect the possibility that maybe I just forgot, or maybe now amidst the trappings of new leadership, authority and position and power and whatever else, I'm now emotionally detached enough from that to, to lose empathy for it. Right. Yeah. So I have what I think is, the world's greatest analogy that I just came up with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> if it yeah. works, uh, if it doesn't work, just edit this whole clip out. Uh, okay. I, I won't be offended <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. Okay. So here's a, this is a Navy, uh, a Navy analogy that I think hopefully people can follow along with. So you are a, division officer on a ship. So say you're a surface warfare officer. That's what I was. That's where this analogy comes from. Um, and you spend every day, you spend, you know, one out of every three watches on the bridge, driving the ship, having all the positions up there to be able to, you know, I won't go in depth, but driving the ship, right? Yeah. You are arguably some of the best people on the entire ship to be able to do it. You know, especially when you're talking five out of 15 hours of your life is spent there for months and months on end. You are probably very good at it. Probably the yeah. peak of, of your existence in this field. OK, then you leave that ship and you go to another ship, but you're not on the bridge anymore. So you're not driving, but you're still pretty close to it. And every once in a while, you might go up there for special evolutions. And so you still have a, a you know, whatever. And you go to a shore tour where you're not on a ship. Okay, so you don't understand it anymore. You go to school, you become a department head. Here's where the analogy starts. If you are a department head and you get on a ship and you don't attempt to drive the ship in the first, let's say, two weeks of being on board, you're yeah. never going to because 
you're going to feel like you're being judged for not being very good. But in the yeah. first two weeks, nobody expects you to be good. Nobody yeah. expects you to be any good because you've been gone for so long. So that is the time to come in and try new things and remember how to drive and be part of the, the holistic picture of everything. Okay, yeah. so let's say you're a department head and you don't go up in the first two weeks, which therefore you probably don't come up in the first two years and you don't drive the ship. Then you do a whole bunch of other stuff and you come back as the executive officer. Do you think that you are going to spend some time in the first two or three weeks driving the ship? Probably not. Because you are definitely going to be judged for not knowing how to drive the ship. Yeah. And so now if you're the CO and you didn't drive as an XO or as a department head, I'm, I promise I'm getting to the end of my analogy. Yeah. Um, do you think that you are going to be in front of all of these people who arguably are at the top of their game right now in driving the ship? Do you think you're going to get up on the bridge and try to learn how to drive? No. So I relate that in one of two ways. It is a positive and a negative. It is the same way in my head with innovation. If you are not trying now uh, or inculcating into, into what you do now, chances are the next phase, you're not going to do it. Yeah. And then the phase after that, you're probably not going to do it. And by the time you get to a chance where you could actually spread your wings and, and fly and really teach people and bring them under your wing and be the champion for people, chances are you're not going to try because you don't either know enough or you don't want to be embarrassed or whatever. Obviously, this is very big generalization. And I don't know if this analogy even works because you're the first person ever hearing it. Um, but uh, so the, that's the, the negative or positive. The flip side of that is um, if you don't actually, um, have the mindset of sticking with the people that are doing the work, yeah. chances are every time you climb the ladder and you go down and you don't ask them what they're doing or how they're doing or, or be involved with it, chances are you're going to get to the end and you're not going to be a good champion. I mean, the yeah. best champion of anybody I've ever met is, uh, well, there's a lot of them, but um, in a military sense for anybody listening to this is Sean heritage. Yeah. Practice what you preach, eat your own dog food. Uh, this is not a one-stop shop. It's an incremental thing. The culture is there. The people all have buy-in it's this, we bring each other up, you know, rising tides, raise all boats type of yeah. thing. Just wanted to throw as many Navy things in as <laughs> humanly possible you can tell me, I'll know later if this analogy was any good, if it makes the cut. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah no, I, that's interesting. Uh, and I also like that brings, I, I like that analogy and I'm going to have to like, I'm going to have to pick it apart in my head to, to really figure out. Um, I think there's a number of ways that it applies, right? Because one of the things that a person has to do in order to be that that enabler um is step into uncertainty like that's step one for innovation and you know innovation empowerment is stepping into uncertainty is being willing to be surprised like you aren't going to be surprised by outcomes if you don't step into uncertainty and being being willing to be surprised and being open to and creating that environment for something surprising to happen, that's how innovation happens. It's not, it's not through a predictable process, right? You, uh, you can't, you can't program a, a computer to innovate unless you incorporate some kind of, you know, randomness algorithm, which I think is being attempted in interesting ways, but that's also how you uh, create Skynet just so you know. That's true. Yeah. 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 You don't want a computer that can be surprised by its own outcomes. That's <laughs> scary. This is, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, but the the willingness to step into uncertainty, I think, diminishes over time as you don't do it, which is what one thing that I heard. Right. It's like uh, one of the, one of the aspects of that is vulnerability, like the willingness to try something new, the willingness to say, I don't know. And one of the. One of the classic models, more mental models, one of the classic models of leadership that we have is this sense of certainty is this sense of knowing what's going to happen right is being able to tell people what's going to happen right uh yep. which is contrary 
to what we need most in order to, to foster innovation. We don't need people who are going to tell us what's going to happen. We need to people who are going to tell us how to make it so we don't know what's going to happen, um, which is, is a vulnerable place, right? Um, it also, an interesting aspect of it is when, you know, when you're a facilitator and you're bringing people into a workshop, one of the things that we have to make clear, and I've seen this, you know, like the issue of rank is one that you have to address constantly as a facilitator in the military. You have to figure out ways, get people to take off their blouse, whatever. We're not showing rank. Part of that is that you don't know if the solution is going to come from the most experienced person in the room or the newest person in the room. And a lot of times I like to bet on the newest person in the room yeah. because Franz Johansson's book, The Media T Effect, he talks about how innovation happens at the intersection of new ideas, right? Or at the intersection of the intersection of disciplines or the intersection of cultures, whatever, you know, you know, who is bringing new culture into the military environment are newbies, you know, that that's where, you know, so we have to kind of like try and uh, capitalize on that. And it takes significant vulnerability for that. Like it's a different type of leadership to bring somebody into the room who's not experienced and say the next big solution might come from inside your head, not mine. And I'm just here to facilitate. Um, and that's kind of like why I view leadership as more leadership is more a facilitator role than it is one of deep expertise. Um, because for the most, especially in knowledge work, right? Because the, because the situation we're working in is always evolving. So it's not like an old factory where the, the oldest guy in the room just understands the machine best that in that scenario, right? It, the old guy probably should, you know, make most of the calls about what's what's going to happen, what's going to fix the problem, right? Yeah. Um, but but not so in in VUCA and whatnot. So your uh, your whole rank thing. This is not just a military thing. This is, uh, mm. you know, there is quote unquote rank seniority bias in. I mean, everywhere you go yeah. and it's the difference between someone that's been there for 20 minutes versus somebody that's been there for 20 years. And yeah. we've talked about that before where it's like, you need both. You yeah. don't want 25 people that have all been there for 20 minutes and you don't want 25 people that have all been there for 20 years because you're either one in a silo or two don't have enough information to even create a silo. So, uh, you know, you, you want some kind of mixture of, of the two and it works both ways. You want a really bad idea to turn into a bad one. It turns into a okay one, good one, great one, excellent one. The one that you implement, the one that you improve upon, the one that you, you know, like. Yeah. And and the only way to do that is to have some kind of back and forth. Like you said, you if you had somebody that can always tell you the outcome, then why isn't the outcome bad? Yeah. I mean, you know, like. If, if you just give this much money or this much time, this outcome will happen. Every leader would look at that and go, okay, that's a perfect equation. We have the resources for it. Let's do it and allocate it. It's like, mm, yeah. it doesn't really work like that. So uh, definitely removing the blouse. I, if anybody is in the military on this end um, or corporate, I try to make it so that there is no way you could ever know. Set the stage before they even get there. There are no... There are no last names here. This is first name only. And hey, guess what? If you don't agree with that, that's okay. You don't need to be part of it. Here's yeah. the thing. You can be respectful of seniority and rank in a bubble. Yeah. In a room, you can say, hey, we're not going to call you sir and ma'am while we're here. When we go off to the bathroom or we have lunch and I know who you are, sure, I'm, I'm going to be respectful of you. But Human beings are human beings. We're going to treat each other with respect. We're going to listen to each other's ideas. And ultimately, we get the credit for whatever transformation takes place, not an individual. So you yeah. don't need to feel guarded if you're the highest, you know, most senior person in the room where the idea didn't come from you. Guess what? Everybody knows that your ideas come from somewhere. So if you say, hey, I was able to accomplish this, this, and this, and it's like, well, how many people... 
uh, you know, were you working with? And that person turns around and goes, well, I have 50 people working for me. It's like, well, semantics. <laughs> we yeah. just said, how many people are you working with? You said four, you said 50, and you're taking credit for all of their work. Yeah. So everybody knows that the good, you know, the bad comes with the good. You got to kind of yeah. try not to yeah, worry at all. That, that's like a mind that that's a shift in mindset uh, that I'd love to see just generally, you know, the me to we kind of, you know, I, I think just that idea can be very powerful. And it was one of the things that really struck me about, uh, you know, like one of the one of the books that kind of affected and inspired me the most to get into studying innovation was uh, Stephen Johnson's book, Where Good Ideas Come From, uh, because it it kind of painted this picture of how an idea, even in even an idea within somebody like an individual's head, like they came up with the idea because they did the work. Even that there's hundreds of people involved. The, that person is just the one who put all those other people's ideas together. They they just facilitated the process of computing and and calculating and experimenting with different ideas until they came to, you know, what they did. But okay. that's not yeah, they but they don't they don't ever deserve sole credit. So even when we're talking about like you know, I think that we like, it's one of those hero stories that we like to tell uh, culturally of the, of the lone genius or of these individual heroes, right? Who, who accomplished something, some great idea. We're constantly telling stories of the great inventor who did this. Oh, it turns out he stole that idea from Tesla. Oh <laughs> yeah, Tesla. Yeah. He like built that off of all these other scientific theories and no, he wasn't just a lone genius operating in a vacuum. It is everything, 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 everything is co-creative. And, and when we don't like embrace that as a, as like an ethic, as like a cultural trait, then we create competitive environments. And then we actually are working against our, what, you know, the natural co-creation that happens. A hundred percent. I think is the best quote. I'm not going to be able to say. It. You probably know it. It's uh, it's in the Pentagon, um, and it's it's not the one that you always hear. Where and maybe I'll find it um, at some point. But it's um, it's not the one that you're used to hearing. Where it's like, imagine what could happen if nobody asked for credit. I think that's you know something to mm. the effect of um, yeah. Uh, gosh, who am I thinking of? Brain malfunction right now. Yeah. Uh, no, I <laughs> It's it's basically like taking taking into account that if we actually genuinely work together and we're not looking at it for our own self interest but for our self interest together collectively, what can be accomplished is just unbelievable. Because now, yeah. guess what? I'm not going to hold on to that idea to tomorrow to look good in front of the boss. I'm going to share it with you, who's potentially working a night shift, who might crack the code. But guess what? I have the trust. That whenever you say it, you're going to go, hey, we were able to bring all this stuff together and we did this, not yeah. I did this. We're always yeah. worried somebody else is going to say I, so we yeah. attempt to say I first so we get <laughs> credit for it. And it's like, this is working against everything. And we all yeah. do it in one way yeah. or another. I mean, it's just a, it's a yeah. magnet how much we do it. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And that's why like the cultural element and being able to like, be, I, I think being able to draw those dichotomies, like that's why I'm so attracted to, to, to pushing that message of uh, collaborate, you know, a, a collaborative or a connective versus competitive culture. Um, you know, I think that, that clinging to, to like, uh, you know, diametrically opposed, uh, cultures like that, like figuring out w how to measure those, what are the symptoms of them, um, you know, w can, can really benefit us in that way, even outside of just normal practice, like understanding, um, what our overall goal here is to, to For get sure. everybody to, to like contribute. We're all pooling together. One of the, there was this, I think it was in game storming or something. He had, you know, there was this analogy where he said, okay, so normally we're playing a game. It's like Scrabble. And we assume that we have to play by the rules, right? Where we, I have my letters and you have your letters, 
But if we changed the game, we could pull our letters together and see how big of a word we could make. <laughs> and I was like, that was like such a perfect demonstration of uh, like question the rules that we're playing by right now, you yeah. know? Like, yeah. And that, you know, just that idea alone. I was like, yeah, we that would be kind of a fun game to... <laughs> What is it? It's like, uh, you know, cooperative games. Scrabble isn't normally a cooperative game, but it could be. <laughs> yeah. Well, you uh, in in a negative, too. You know, like if I let you break the rules in Scrabble and I'm like, hey, I'm not going to look that word up in the dictionary, then, uh, you know, it works both ways, positive and yeah. negative. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I we're at we're at about an hour. Uh, is there anything that you want to touch on before we wrap this one up? I, I have had just a, a fantastic time kind of wandering down, down these, uh, thought corridors with you Definitely. and here come the, the, uh, landscaping equipment. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. cool. Well, I, uh, I don't think I have anything. <laughs> I have nothing to say. I have nothing, uh, Additional to say from what I what I did last time, I, I thought this was this conversation was awesome. Didn't even feel like an hour whatsoever for me. I mean, not even close. You said it was an hour, and I was like, "What in the world?" Yeah. Um, I feel like there's a way to make your culture, your organization, whether it's innovative, creative, human centered design. There's a way to make it like that. What do you mean we've yeah. been here for a month? What do you mean it's time to leave already? You know, it can be fun type of thing. I don't know if yeah. that enough plays, but just edit out all the stuff where I didn't sound <laughs> super legit. Um, sure. And I will tell you, I was wearing, I found this out right before we got on because um, I was looking up Karen's uh, video. I found out that I was wearing the same shirt today that I was the last time we spoke. So I changed the shirt just for you. Um, that's not a very good exit of of a podcast, but thought it was just weird enough to say to you that would be brighten your day a little bit. So I uh, <laughs> it would <was, it, laughs> what what did he just say? No, uh, I mean that's that's great. interesting that you that you noticed you were wearing the same shirt. I <laughs> yeah I. I, you know, I honestly don't have anything, anything to say in response to that. And I think I should be allowed to not have anything to say. Yeah, you don't need to. That's perfect. No, I appreciate it. Uh, hopefully. All right. Again. Yep. Looking forward to next time, John. Do we hang up or do you hit stop record and then we high five each other? Or are we actually saying goodbye right now? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, usually I hang up and then I send a message. Okay. So. This is this is our fake goodbye. Oh, okay. For okay. the audience. All right. Hey, uh, All right. really great talking to you. I'll uh, I'll talk to you some other time. Take care, man. Yeah, I'll <laughs> take care. I definitely won't be speaking to you before the next episode <laughs> or right after I hang this up.